OK. Let me cover systolic arrays as well, and then we'll conclude this lecture. That covers all, uh, lots of execution models, hopefully. Now you see how creative people have been in the past. This is actually a very fun concept, I think. This was developed at CMU for the first time. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, like, a, like a heart, if you will. Data flows from the computer memory in a rhythmic fashion, passing through many processing elements before it returns to memory. Memory is your heart, right? It basically pumps data into your veins, and uh, the blood flows through all of your cells, and your cells operate on the blood. Well, or blood enables the operation of the cells. That's another thing. Eventually, blood comes back to the heart and gets pumped again. So you don't need to, the heart doesn't send separate pieces of blood to different cells. Right? That's the key. Well, why is this a good idea? This is similar to an assembly line. Different people work on the same car. Many cars are assembled simultaneously, and this can be two-dimensional. We'll take a look at that. So the reason this was developed was uh, mainly this, actually. You, you have imbalanced data and computation. And data access was difficult. If you access memory, and if, you're, uh, if, if you do only one operation on it, you need to access memory again. Right? Whereas if you access memory once, and if you do many, many operations on it, you don't need to access memory as much. So you save memory bandwidth. So the goal was here to co balance computation and IO access in special purpose accelerators. And uh, the goal was also to design a simple, regular hardware and, uh, that, that gets you high performance or high concurrency. So let me give you an example. Basically, this is an example from this uh, really nice article that I would recommend to everyone again. H.T. Kong was a professor at CMU at the time when he developed this. But basically, the problem was this. If you have this memory and a single processing element, uh, and if you keep uh, access memory, do processing, write the result back, and then access memory again, do some processing, write the result back. If you keep doing that, you're limited by your memory bandwidth. Right? How many times you can access memory per unit time? Whereas if you can do something like this, if you access memory, get the, do some processing on the data, transform it to something else, send the data to another processing element, Transform, which transforms it to something else, and sends the data to another processing element, which transforms it to something else, dot, dot, dot. And eventually, the data gets written back to memory. You can do a lot more processing over here. So instead of connecting memory and processing elements this way, maybe there's another processing element over here, you chain the processing elements. You pipeline the processing elements. And these are, you can now think of the memory as a heart, and processing elements as the cells, right? And cells are chained together via the veins. Does that make sense? That's the idea. It's kind of nice. Uh, the downside is this processing element that's in the middle now cannot directly access memory, right? You really have to go through this chain. So now you're specializing the architecture. If your computation is nice such that all of the operations need to go through these different processing elements, then that's great because you've saved a lot of memory bandwidth. This model is nice if, for programmability, if you will, right? because you can have another processing element connected to memory, another processing element connected to memory, another one connected to memory, and they can all be independent. And you don't need to go through this chain. Now you need to go through this chain. Okay. So when, when is this good, I guess? The basic principle, we're replacing a single processing element with a regular array of processing elements. And we're going to carefully orchestrate flow of data between the processing elements, such that we can accomplish some tasks. This achieves high throughput without increasing memory bandwidth requirements. And if you do this calculation here, it says 5 million operations per second at most. At most. Here, you can do 30 million operations per second. Uh, so that you can think of this as pipelining, actually, right? You're really pipelining the processing elements. But the difference is. Uh, you can have this array structure to be nonlinear and multidimensional. If you read this paper, it actually talks about nonlinear arrays. You can have a matrix, for example, and you can input x-axis of the image from the top, or y-axis of the image from the top, and x-axis from the uh, sides, and you can do a lot of processing. Uh, processing element connections can be multidirectional. They can be different speed. 
And processing elements can actually have local memory and execute kernels. So this idea of systolic computation has led to what, it, what we will call a staged execution. And I'll, to, I'll, I'll tell you about that. OK. Uh, so where, where is this good at? This was actually developed for image and vision processing. Uh, but one thing uh, that's, uh, that fits nicely is convolution. Have you guys studied convolution before? OK. In your EE courses, EE, is it EE 100 or? 290, Two, right? Yes, that's right. Basically, you must know of this, right? It's used in filtering, pattern matching, many, many things. Many image processing tasks, many vision processing tasks, and many other things. So let's take a look at how you can design a systolic array that can basically do this convolution. And this is uh, from the article that I recommended to you. Basically, this is what the systolic array looks like. Uh, you have weights stored in the processing elements, because weights do not change, right? Y1 is calculated with weight 1 times x1 plus weight 2 plus x, weight 2 times x2 plus weight 3 th plus, uh, times x3. This is how y2 is calculated. This is how y3 is calculated. And they all use weights. So weights are stored in the processing elements. And the data values, the input sequence x is pumped in from this way. Basically, you pump data from memory. x1 is pumped in first. And it arrives at this processing element at this time. And when it arrives at this processing element, y1 is pumped in. And y1 is the output. And the, what the processing element does is, this is what the processing element does, basically. It basically takes x in and outputs it from its x out. And then it also computes this value. Uh, y out, basically going out here, is y in plus weight that's stored in the processing elements times x in. So in the first cycle, when the x1 reaches this processing element, at the end of that, the result will be, I guess, y1 equals, uh, well, the result over here is y1 plus w1 plus x, uh, w1 times x1, right? And then when, in the next cycle, x2 will reach this processing element. And the data over here will be w1x1, right? And the end of the next cycle, what you will have over here is w1x1 plus w2x2, right? Does that make sense? And then in the next cycle, x3 will reach this processing element. And the result over here will reach this processing element. And the result will be, so now you have w1 plus x, w1 plus x1. Uh, w1x1 plus w2x2 over here, and you'll add w3x3 over here. So you'll get y1 outputted as this value. Similarly, by orchestrating this y2, well, the next thing that's coming in is actually y2 over here, you'll get the right results. Make sense? OK. If you're, if you're not convinced, take a look at the paper or go through this exercise. But this is basically a very specialized structure that does convolution in a very simple way. Now, the design of the processing elements are really simple. And the paper actually goes into more detail into the design. So you can actually implement the adder and multiplier separately, such that you can, uh, 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 you can overlap adder and multiplier operations. And in this design, actually, you lose some efficiency because you, pump, you can pump in x only every other cycle. And you can pump out data only every other cycle. OK. Make sense? For this kind of computation, at least. Of course, this is very specialized, right? So how do you actually make this more general purpose? Uh, well, first, one thing is you can store multiple weights. right? You, and you can uh, enable the selection of the weights on the fly or online, dynamically. This eases the implementation of many methods like adaptive filtering. And taken further, this leads to different programming models uh, each processor, processing element can actually have its own data and instruction memory. And people have built machines like that. Uh, the data memory is used to store partial or temporary results that are just needed by the processing element instead of going to memory or constants. And this leads to what's called stream processing or pipeline parallelism today, or more generally, stage execution. I'll briefly talk about that too. Uh, we haven't talked about pipeline parallelism, right? Have you guys programmed this way at all? No? I guess. OK. 
Let me see if I can do justice to it. Well, I can do a very brief justice to it, I guess. <laughs> Basically, you can, uh, this is one way of parallelizing programs. We talk about parallelizing iterations, right? If iterations are independent of each other, you can execute them in parallel. But what if iterations are not independent of each other? Well, portions of iterations may be independent, right? If you look at this, uh, what might happen is uh, this code in stage, uh, you, you may have some code in this part of the loop, some other code here, some other code here. Let's call them stages. And what might happen is these are uh, stage A, stage B, stage C. The w one way you can parallelize this loop is you can divide, uh, you can have the different iterations of the loop executing at different stages like this. And this is, uh, this is uh, the loop's execution on a single processor. You, you execute stage A from iteration 0, stage B from uh, iteration 0, stage C from iteration 0. And then you go back to stage A from iteration 1, dot, dot, dot. Instead, you can split the loop into three pipeline stages and ensure that different processors execute these different stages. For example, the one reason for this might be you may have some data uh, that's needed just by the stage. And you want to keep that in the caches of that processor. In that case, you actually execute this stage A, but different iterations of stage A on the same processor. And stage B is executed on another processor. Stage C is executed on another processor. And these may be operating on different working sets, different parts of the working set. And the way uh, you get parallelism is you have different processors executing different stages at any given point in time. And the loop execution is really pipelined across processors. A0 executes here in the first time step. B0 executes after it's done. C0 executes after it's done. Make sense? OK. There may, I mean, this works only if you can do this, right? Ideally, you would like to minimize communication between these different stages in a loop. OK. I'm going really fast because I want to finish on time. But you can uh, read about this. One example uh, of stage processing is file compression, for example. This is uh, a number of stages. Uh, let's, let's assume that you actually have a loop that compresses lots of files. You give the input or par portions of the files. You give an input file that gets allocated in one stage. And the input is read in another stage. The input is compressed in another stage. And the input is written in another stage. And the, uh, what is allocated is deallocated in the next stage. You can think of this as different stages executed on different processors. And different processors can be specialized for the execution of different stages. And systolic arrays are kind of like that, because you're really getting some input data, transforming it to something else, and executing on it on a processor that can potentially be specialized for that, which is transforming the data and uh, placing it into a queue, if you will, that's executed by the next stage, which is perhaps executed on a processor that's specialized for compression. Right? And then, well, this is a simple example, but you could think of uh, embedded processing, and you could do video decoding, for example. Right? In fact, this is a good way of programming accelerators. You can pipeline the execution of different accelerators such that a program doesn't need to communicate with memory as much. OK, I think I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages quickly. Any questions so far? Okay. This is uh, basically the systolic arrays have led to notions like pipeline parallelism, where you can uh, parallelize the code and specialize the execution of each pipeline stage. The advantages, you can now make multiple uses of each data item. Right? You reduce the need of fetching and refetching. You enable high concurrency as a result. And you have a regular design. Both data and control flow is regular. The disadvantage, well, this is true for uh, SIMD processing as well. Right? This is not very good at exploiting irregular parallelism. And it's very specialized. It's relatively special purpose. You need software programmer support to be a general purpose model. Yes? So you would say you, know, you reduce the need for needing fetching and refetching. But if you really need to fetch something that many times, wouldn't it just be in the registers? Uh, you may need to fetch different data, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. 
So I think I'll stop here. You can read about the warp computer, uh, which is basically an implementation of a systolic array, the, the concepts. Uh, we'll, we'll start with that perhaps in the next lecture. Okay. <laughs>